Hello, my name is Renee Nicholson, and I am director of the Humanities Center at West Virginia University, and this is our series Short Talks. And today I am with Melissa Ostrom, and she is the author of two books, including the novel The Beloved Wild, which we'll be chatting about today, as well as the novel Unleaving, and many, many published stories. And uh, so as a way to start our chat today, uh, I was going to ask Melissa if she might just share a bit of The Beloved Wild with us. Sure. <clears throat> Here it is. <laughs> I'll show the cover. Yeah, oh, mine won't show. It just turned into WVU. There we go. <laughs> it's a historical novel, historical YA. And um, it's a book about Harriet Winter, a young girl who ends up um, going west with her brother as a pioneer. But it starts in New England, in New Hampshire. And um, actually, I'm going to read just a little bit from the beginning. Um, because it introduces sort of her, um, some of her angst that she's feeling early on. Um, this scene is a fireside scene after dinner. And um, one person in particular is there who she doesn't want to see. And that's the neighbor who her mother is always inviting over. Daniel Long is the person that her um, Harriet's parents want her to marry. Um, he's an, a nice guy. <laughs> and there are a lot of great things about Daniel, but the fact that he was chosen for her really rubs her the wrong way, as we can imagine, you know, because who wants their mom or dad to pick their um, future spouse? So the scene I'm going to read from is, is um, when they're all the men are making spiles, which are just little spouts for um, tapping into maple trees during the sugarling season. Um, and let's see, I'll just start right here. Mama was the one who had invited him to dinner, surely hoping an evening involving whittling spouts would give him the chance to shine. For everyone in Middleton, New Hampshire knew that Daniel Uriah Long had a special genius for carving wood. It would be impossible not to know this. Each thing he built from the topmost rafter of his house, the armrest he fashioned for the end of his meeting house pew, bore his initials and a date, DUL 1808, DUL 1806, DUL 1809. There was nothing specifically wrong with Daniel Uriah Long. I'd be the first to admit that he was an excellent farmer. And yes, he boasted a strong frame, capable of handling the most arduous task. As for his whittling, I really couldn't accuse him of vanity since in all fairness, most men of my acquaintance signed their handiwork. Daniel Long was simply a great one for puttering with wood. This of course resulted in a surplus of initials. And those initials shy of one letter set it off his every aspect lacked impetuosity, mystery, devilment. It was difficult to work up a romantic passion for Mr. DUL. Yet inexplicably, he'd managed to stir within his plodding heart and interest in me. It was no secret in Middleton that the man hoped in the near future to fix me with his tedious initials. Just the thought of this expectation raised my hackles. After I finally folded the towel in the kitchen and joined the fireside circle, I was feeling particularly mulish and shook my head when Papa requested a song. The scent of singed sumac hung in the air. Plenty of spiles filled a few maple sugar buckets between Matthew and Gideon, but Mr. Long continued to whittle away at one from time to time answering a question, usually without looking up. In the reddish light, I could see that along the spout, he carved a tiny but intricate leafy vine. Rather fancy for a spout, isn't it, Danny? Mr. Long nodded, Cabot. His mildness goaded me to add, you forgot to etch in your initials. Quick as a snap, his eyes met mine, so I did, to rectify the omission and held up the spout for you. Surprised by the gesture, I didn't immediately take it. Then just as I leaned forward to accept the gift, he retrieved it, leaving my hand dangling stupidly. His mouth quivered. Perhaps I ought to carve your initials in it as well, since it will be yours. He raised his eyebrows expectantly. I folded my arms. I doubt there's room for anything else on the little thing. I'll squeeze them in. It's H then S, I offered grudgingly. H.S.W. Harriet S. Winter, he said evenly as he carved. 
What's the S for, Sarah, Sally? I tightened my mouth and shook my head. I despise my middle name. Betsy, sitting at Papa's feet, offered, submit. That's what it stands for. For the first time that night, Mr. Long laughed. Submit, oh, that's rich. As he presented the spout, he asked, still grinning, and do you? I took it with a slow, ungracious show of disinterest, but answered curtly and quickly enough. No, never. <laughs> we meet the two, Adeline. Yes, the lovers. <laughs> and it does uh, really set up the book quite well. And and uh, I have to say, I loved the the kind of clever uh, use of the initials for uh, Daniel Uriah Long or D U L, uh, which is exactly how Harriet feels about him in the beginning. <laughs> It's and nice to hear. <laughs> Very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, must have had a, a fun to put that that little signifier in there as a writer. <laughs> so um, you write, you know, both uh, young adult fiction and literary fiction, and I would say that most of many of your works kind of span the two. Um, so maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that and, and talk about the differences or similarities or how your approach um, might differ uh, as you consider different audiences. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know that there is a huge difference between writing for young people and writing literary fiction. Um, the longer works, I mean, you have your audience to consider. so. You know, if I were writing a book for adults, maybe um, the main character would have just lost her job and it would be something that would, you know, propel the action. In a young adult book, it might be that the young person's mom lost her job or she, you know, the, the character herself wants a job and she can't get one, she's not old enough. So you have obviously things that you have to, to address with the audience, but um, as far as just writing a novel, in general, there's so many similar things that you have to think about, regardless of the audience. It's, there's, it's such an investment in world building and investment in um, research. Um, I think the difference for me is in um, short fiction and then longer fiction. That feels very different to me. Um, like flash fiction feels a little bit um, magical. I can be reading a poem and one word can make me think, dragons. I need to write a little story about dragons and that can be enough to, you know, create that. Sure. Um, it's almost like you don't have to invest so much time in, in the road building because you're just inviting your reader in for something, you know, it's like you can see some of my office and that's enough for me to clean is my office. You don't know what a mess my house is. You can't. <laughs> but with a novel, the reader will see the mess. You, have, you will walk them around that house. So you right. have a lot more work to do. And, um, you know, you can also look at it in terms of threads with a short story. You probably are investing just one narrative thread, whereas with a novel, uh, you have your main character, but you're going to have many subplots and you're going to have other characters. And, you know, as in the case of the beloved wild, you'll have characters who end up becoming foils for the main character in some way. So you have to think about uh, their stories and their desires and what's going to be um, the obstacles that they'll face in attaining those desires. Sure. Yeah. And you have um, several of those kind of built into the Beloved Wild. Uh, you know, there's Rachel, who's a friend, but also a foil to Harriet. There's her uh, closest brother, Gideon. I mean, there's just, and uh, it, it's uh, really fun to see how their various stories sort of braid each other. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, they're not completely wholly separate, but they're, they are different strands, right? And you can kind of see that, you know, the same way that you would see, you know, the length of a braid and how things come together, but how they're distinct. Wow. So, yeah, it, it such a good point too about the short form, long form, uh, you know, and the things 
that you're trying to do there and in the different approach to the audience uh so uh you know the, all really um interesting things to consider when you're thinking you know uh, sometimes people are like, oh, well, you sit down to write, what's your process? And you've got to be like, let's step back a second and mm -hmm. let's see what form, for whom, what was the little kernel impetus for it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I think with a longer piece, you're much more aware of um, having to plant seeds along the way because you you have to get to that ending and, and you want the ending to make sense. And, you know, not that I am a big, huge planner, but I will sit down and, you know, I'll know what my ending is and I'll know kind of some overriding um, things that I want to accomplish. I might even have in my mind some good dynamics, but I leave a lot of room for surprise. I think with short fiction, you can really let yourself be more of a cancer and be surprised. <laughs> you know? Right. Because we've been in that situation where we've read a long book and we can tell that that person was flying by the, the seat of their pants because right. the ending, we were like, wait, things aren't adding up here. <laughs> right, right. What's the <laughs> famous check off it you know if the gun's going to go off in act three you have to plan it in act one i think or some something to that effect right, right. yeah so planting those seeds and it's true you the things that you don't have to plan out as much in a shorter piece versus the things that you really do have to pay attention to in a longer piece right uh, yeah that's and just keep track of right well and on top of that in the beloved wild you have the historical context right um you know it's set in the early 1800s and i have to think like there you know with the details that you weave into the book you had to have done some some research and so i'm interested to know a little bit of what kind of research you do to be authentic to the period and to the place um, and how that helps you shape the characters and what's going on in the book right yeah you know Writing it after I finished the beloved wild, I thought I will never write another historical novel. <laughs> um, and then I ended ended up writing another one. It's it's a middle grade historical that takes place around the heyday of the Erie Canal, but that's been set aside. I kind of can't believe that I wrote another historical novel because it is really difficult. You're um, you're doing more than one thing at once, you know, with a contemporary piece, you, you, you're not so worried about um, the accuracy of the road because you know that road, you live it every day. Right. But with historical fiction, yeah, it's like, and let me tell you, people out there reading, there are people who are looking for those mistakes and, and they will spy them and it will bother them to no end. So you really have to um, do your homework. I did a lot of research. I read so many books. Um, it's hard to find books on just the the day to day life of um, you know uh, people during a, a, a particular period. This takes place in the very early eighteen hundreds. Um, I did find a couple of books. What ended up being most valuable to me were probably diary entries. Ah. Um, because there was one book I really, I just was so grateful for. Um, a judge in the mid 1800s put it together, this compilation of pioneer reminiscences. So these were all pioneers who had settled in the Genesee Valley, which is of course where the Beloved Wild takes place. It's also where I live. So I, it was fun reading those because I would recognize areas and I'm like, oh, that's still called that. And, you know, I know exactly where that is. And, oh, that's neat. Um, yeah, they were very helpful to me. Um, also just really inspiring. One thing that I didn't really think about or even know before delving into this research was how young the pioneers were. Um, they were teenagers. Wow. They were second sons, third sons, fourth sons who weren't going to get a piece of the, at least not the good property um, in New England. You know, that mm -hmm. that land had been tapped, um, the forest had been taken down. So 
this novel really represents an era that is unique and that it's the first wave of westward expansion. Yeah. We don't usually think of Western New York as being the Wild West, but it, at that point it was. So yeah, it was fun to, to just think about that in terms of my own backyard and <laughs> you know, knowing how rich the soil is and gardening it and living on Lake Ontario and it's yeah. the country, so seeing the orchards, it was kind of neat to to think about those early settlers who discovered that richness for themselves. Wow. Yeah, that is, that's, and, you know, around that same time, you know, this area, you know, North Central West Virginia and um, just north of us in uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania was being surveyed by folks like General Washington. <laughs> Think about this, you know, this was the frontier at one point, right? And now, you know, um, you know, over time, those, those boundaries are pushed now, now they are uh, underwater in outer space, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> They're di very different places. But yeah, um, it's a fascinating thing. The diary entries, that's that's a fascinating piece there. And there were things that when I was reading it, um, and I don't think this will be giving too much away, but they're constructing a cabin at one point. And it's like, where do you put the outhouse? And there's some discussion about what's between the main dwelling and the outhouse to make it smell better <laughs> and where wind wise it should go. And I'm like, that, I wouldn't have even thought of those things, but yeah, those are really important decisions. <laughs> really important <laughs> right? it, 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 it did really those little tiny details like that make it feel alive um you know i talked once with um the novelist uh pr the novelist uh, patricia henley and about her book hummingbird house and she has two nba teams playing in that book in the playoffs that would never play each other in the playoffs and it's like you know a national book award finalist and that's the thing everybody brings up to her so <laughs> i think we all are like yeah you got to get the every time you you have to get your moon in the right sky but you got to get every little star too cuz somebody's going <laughs> to tell you mm -mm -mm. <laughs> You know, you'll see that sometimes when you check out a, a book from the library where someone has penciled in a correction. And, <laughs> you know, like, okay. This yeah. is an, a natural editor. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, also you were talking about the, the youth of, of the, these pioneers, right? And Harriet, is she's young, but she is a determined female character, right? And during that time period, she would be very constrained by her gender, um, right? And she goes to great lengths to overcome that. And I'm not going to talk too much so people will want to read the whole book. Um, she's also saddled with that middle name, Submit, which was a, yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, and all of this makes her incredibly complex, right? Um, and interesting. And I'm hoping you can share a little bit about how you kind of create these sort of complex characters and how this journey, how Harriet's journey sort of unfolded for you in your imagination. That's funny that you bring up her middle name because earlier you had asked, you know, how does research sort of play into your, your narrative decisions? And that was one thing that I um, discovered in researching that era, how the names are names that we just don't use anymore, but they would just be so outrageous, like um, thankful, you know, thankful Ostrom. Like that would be a very <laughs> weird name to have now. And so it was one of those strange names that stuck with me. And of course, it, it is like the worst possible name for Harriet. But I can say that her character, I first thought of her character when I was um, I, I was taking a walk and I was down on Woodchuck Alley closer to the lake and it's this beautiful old graveyard. Um, I was looking for some trilliums to dig up and steal <laughs> from my family, <laughs> which I don't think I'm supposed to do, but um, I was I noticed a family plot of gravestones and it was like I couldn't make sense of it at first because I could see, okay, here's the man gravestone. And then it looked like he had three wives. I'm like, that can't be right. And then I realized 
they were consecutive wives that he had had a wife and she died and then he had another wife and she died and so on and then you notice the baby plots around there and so it got me thinking how really strange it would be to be a young person a young girl um, during a time when you really had one option for your future that was socially condoned and that would have been marriage and uh, raising a family and then to also have the knowledge that that was a number one killer for for people i mean i don't think that any of us really think about that like you know if i said to a person well you can become an astronaut if you want but you need to know that you have a 10 percent chance of dying we probably wouldn't get a lot of astronauts <laughs> You know, even worse would be the knowledge that that was your only job option. Like you have to do that um, or else risk, I don't know, just being ostracized in some way. So I think that Harriet is very conscious of that because her biological mother, of course, in the very beginning, you find out she died um, having Harriet. And then Harriet was her father remarried. Um, Harriet's very close to her mother's, you know, technically her, her stepmother, but she, this is the only mother that she's known. But she's thinking always about her biological mother and, you know, what people tell her about that, that mother, what a wonderful girl she was and how beautiful she was and how um, you know, she, she died so young and how tragic that is. And of course, Harriet can see the grave herself because they have the family plot on the property. So it's, I think that that is something that she carries as a grief, but also as a sort of burden of my mother died really for me. She died so that she could have me. And now what am I going to do with my life? You know, what, what am I going to, what am I going to do that um, earns that sacrifice? And she, I think that she's very conscious of that. I also think that Harriet in some ways is very lucky in this book and that she has a father and a mother who dote on her. You know, they both um, really have give her some freedom. It's not that she's not expected to do the, the household chores that girls would do and the spinning and the, you know, the cooking and the helping in that way. But you can tell that she is sort of pampered a little bit and that she's allowed, you know, to have maybe more voice than a, a girl might have in another family during this time period. Um, but that freedom, the, the, the limits of that freedom comes home to her very quickly in the beginning when she finds that her brother, Gideon, her favorite brother, really the only brother that she likes, is going to pioneer um, in the Genesee Vale, and he's going to leave. First of all, she's going to lose her best friend, but also he's going to do something that she's uh, she can't do. You know, she couldn't buy a car stolen from the Halloween company, no matter how cheap it was. That wouldn't be an option for her. Sure. Oh, so she's um, she she has that on her plate. I think that that is something that readers today, young people today, can kind of connect to, where they can have a friend that they feel like they're equals with and they do everything with them and they you know, have the same interests and the same fun. And then something can happen to make them see that person go in a different direction. You know, We probably all remember that friend that we invited over to play Barbies and they were like, I don't play with Barbies anymore. And like, what do you mean you don't play with Barbies? <laughs> all of a sudden your life goes in a different direction from your possibly your best friend and Harriet sees that like her brother is going to have this wonderful adventure and her future is the neighbor boy Daniel Long. <laughs> That's something that really bothers her. So right. Yeah. Yeah. No, and and you're you're right. Um and and see, you know, she does for that time period have a lot of latitude. And then today's reader would think was really constrained. And we even see with other characters that she's close to um, how much, you know, they're confined compared to her. So um, it really does give you sort of that rich portrait. 
Um, and it's always nice to see uh, like any character having that kind of complexity um, because it forces us to kind of think in a different way. Um, and it also kind of makes us like them more when they're overcoming things, right? If it's too easy, we're like, that was easy, <laughs> right? Yeah. These aren't so easy. <laughs> I really like characters who have, you know, they have that something that they have to overcome. And they also have sometimes character flaws that get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. Nothing more annoying than a perfect character. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Now they're doing this. They have this magical power. And why not that one, too? You know? right. um, I like those characters who are, um, yeah, they have bad tempers. <laughs> you know? When I think of some of my favorite characters, Anne Shirley, you know, she, she's vindictive. But she spent the whole first book of Anne Green Gables wanting to beat Gilbert Blythe and everything. <laughs> um, and she doesn't forgive him, even when he seeks that forgiveness. She's like, oh, I'm not gonna forgive you. Um, and you know, Elizabeth Bennett and Pride and Pedges, mm -hmm. those characters who are hot tempered and they say how they feel and they're, you know, they're just fun to read. Absolutely, yeah, I agree, I agree. Uh, and I can see a little bit Elizabeth Bennett in, in Harriet, for sure. I um, think it's a compliment, I love it. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, honestly, uh, there are many a Jane Austen character here that if, if I saw them in, in writing, I would be like, that's the highest compliment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So speaking of which, um, you know, your writing style, uh, you know, when I was reading The Beloved Wild, I just admired the language, um, which is also something you have in, in common with those other writers. And particularly, you have strong, wonderful active verbs, like it just brings you right into, into the moment. And so... Um, I, I wanted to see if you would share a little bit about what you think about language when you're writing and um, or editing and revising and if there were any past teachers that inform that style or writers that influence you, which gets a little bit to uh, Miss Austin. Uh, yes, definitely Jane Austen. I reread her books before, you know, while really while writing The Beloved Wild, I felt like I had to live in history to write a historical novel sure. um, because that world isn't easily accessible just you know what, with what we're doing so um yeah i i would say that thanks for the nice words about my writing i i, I guess i really am influenced by um, poetry a lot i i value poetry i when I first started writing, that was really what I wanted to be was a poet. And um, when I went to college, I, I was an English major, but I had a concentration in creative writing. And, and um, it, at Binghamton, I got to study with Ruth Stone, which was a real honor. And she <laughs> was so influential. And um, in grad school, I got to study with Paul Muldoon. So I had, had some wonderful teachers. Um, but I don't think I'm really naturally a poet. My brother is a poet. <laughs> that the reason I'm not, you know, I want to have two poets or two <laughs> poet writers in the family. Like we really, you know, he kind of has his camp and I have mine and um, we give each other a lot of feedback, but um, I, I, but I do feel that, that attention to language is important. And writing a lot of short fiction helps me in that way as well. It, especially flash fiction, you're given, you know, when you produce something that's so short, you really have no excuse for not um, reading it a lot and revising it a lot and, and, and being very purposeful in your use of language and, and punctuation. Um, so I think that, that that helps me a lot. But, yeah, there are many writers I admire. Um, some of them have very different styles from me and just because they have different backgrounds. I, I used to teach Zora Neale Hurston's um, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Which is, uh, it's so amazing, so many different ways. But um, with my when I was a high school teacher with my 10th graders, I did Sandra Cisneros' The House on Mingo Street, which I think is an interesting book in terms of straddling that poetry, prose, 
kind of world with the yeah. little vignettes. Um, I, I love Elizabeth Strout. There are some writers like Elizabeth Strout who are so good, they are sort of invisible to the reader. Like they don't have, they're not jazz handy at all. They're not trying to get you to remember that they're writing this book. Um, and in that, I think, I think there's a confidence in that and there's a skill in that, but they can write so well that um, there's an immediacy to the reading experience um, that I really admire. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Yeah, and I brought up a few books. I'm reading this one right now, um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Noro. I don't know if you've ever read it, but by Susanna Clark. I'm really enjoying it. I'm actually revising a fantasy novel, so I'm, I've been reading some fantasy just to stay in that room. Um, the Earth Sea series is another one I'm reading now by Ursula Le Guin. Um, yeah. And this is amazing. I, I just think that this is so good. She's a poet. Inger Christensen, um, The Condition of Secrecy is, is the book. I don't know if I can see that, but yeah. um, really liking that. There are books that I'll return to. Um, Mary Rufo's Madness, Rack, and Honey is one that, <laughs> oh, I know I'm always going back to it. I just, I just love it. Um, Maggie Nelson's Fluent. There's some books that you just want to read and reread. Um, yeah. They kind of have, I call them magic books. They have that quality. I there, there are magic books out there. And I think for different people, they may be different magic books. Or we tap into the magic of different writers when we need them. But there are certain ones that they, they just um, stay with you. And they speak to you for whatever reason. <laughs> you know, sometimes reasons you can't even quite pinpoint. Yeah. I, you know, a poet that I return to a lot is uh, Jean Mead, um, The House of Poured Out Water. Um, and it just, she just speaks to me on an essential level. Like sometimes I don't know that I can even really explain why mm -hmm. <laughs> it just is. Um, yeah. And there's something lovely about having that too. But um, the writers that you mentioned are all just spectacular and, and, I can see, and I like how, well, I'm writing this, so so here's this sphere of influence almost, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the different um, books that you had mentioned, and, and thank you for sharing that. I know a lot of people are like, what do I read next, right, and so you've just given us a, a wonderful book list. Oh, good, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, it's helpful to sort of stay in, in a mode when you're reading, um, you know. There are just some writers that are so helpful in that way. But I would say that's especially true for historical fiction because that language has changed so much. So that can help you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Well, we're getting close to time here. So I want to ask you one more question just to sort of wrap up. And, and that is, you know, um, since our audience uh, for the short talks are mostly humanity scholars and um, students and instructors and, and the like. So what do you want um, humanities folks to know about your work? You know, my former agent um, and friend, Rebecca Stead, said something about my pieces that I've I feel like it was such a nice compliment. And I always, um, it, it's, it made me happy because I think, think that it's true about my life. And she said that my books have such a strong sense of community. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that that's um, true when I'm writing them. I feel like my characters are my friends and, and I feel that relationship with them. And I'd like to see their relationships with each other um, and one another when, when you have this um, sort of cast of characters, how they, how they interact um, can be such a beautiful thing and, and sometimes fun and sometimes difficult and messy, um, but always this sort of uh, connection. And, and I think that that's true in my life. I'm not a particularly social person, but I, the friends I have, I'm very loyal to, and I feel, you know, I feel a strong connection with them. And I think that readers who like my books probably, probably like them because of 
the characters' relationships with each other. They like to know, like they like to sort of be part of that um, gathering of love and togetherness. And and that so that that was a nice compliment, and and I really appreciate that because it's something that you know it's true in my own life. Um, I think too, for any of your scholars, um, I hope that if they want to be writers, if that's something that they pursue. So often education now, and I know, you know, I hear this as a teacher myself, I've been teaching for 20 some years and, and I'm sure you do as well. We, we hear so much about, well, what, what are they going to get out of this education? And, and immediately the, the, the conversation goes toward jobs and um, income. And that's important. I don't want to say that that's not important, but um, I really feel that first and foremost, you know, especially in education and humanities, is, is to develop and to cultivate um, curiosity and connectedness and that desire to just learn and what a gift that is to be in, a, in college and in, a, in an environment to learn and to learn everything you can. And if you want to write to, to do that, to not, you know, I, I say that with some poignancy because I grew up poor. My parents were teenagers when they married. And, and it was very clear to me that when I went to college, you know, I better get that degree that's going to give me a license of some sort and, and help me make a living. And that was, of course, teaching. And it's not that I didn't want to be a teacher, but it's like my other interests seem like foolish fantasies <laughs> and really my writing did go on hold like I felt like I need to just um I've chosen teaching and that's what I need to do and I didn't return back to writing until years after I was in into my teaching profession so um I think that it it's important for people to know that they can pursue their dreams it might be difficult um it might mean like going a couple of years without doing what they want, really want to do, but saving and saving and saving and trying to make that possible. But mm -hmm. such a worth, worthwhile thing <laughs> yeah. for any reason other than the fact that it's it's incredibly satisfying to, to, to be a creative person and to have that um, passionate vocation of exercising creativity. That's a really wonderful thing. And then, so I guess, yeah, that would be something else I tell students to not, not give up too quickly or easily on, on those dreams. Yeah. Well, I can't think of a more perfect place to, <laughs> to end on, um, on that a bit of inspiration and we all need that so um melissa i just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today well, thank you renee thank you for having me it's been fun it has